Act is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, I am a new student here. Hello, what can I do for you? Can you tell me what the Student Union does? Well, we're part of the National Union of Students, who represents students' interests across the country. We provide services for all students at this college. What kind of services? There are advisors and welfare staff, entertainments, sports clubs, union societies, meetings, campaigns, and special interest groups. We offer everything from ballroom dancing to karate, jazz, and political debates. Sounds great. How can you help overseas students? As I've said, we have welfare officers who are used to the sort of problems overseas students may have. They know where to get advice on a particular situation or basically give whatever help is asked for. I am from the Philippines, and I hope I can meet other Filipino students who are here. I play chess and many sports, especially badminton, basketball, and wrestling. Please, can you tell me how to find out about these things? There is a Filipino society at the college. Regular meetings take place, and lots of social activities are organized, such as meals, plays, and dances. The society is made up of Filipino students and other students who have an interest in the Philippines. And what about the sports? Does the union offer the ones I'm interested in? Yes, we do. There are basketball and wrestling teams. If you want to play in one of the college teams, you have to go along to training sessions and compete for a place. For badminton, you can either go to the badminton club or book a court to play with friends. Is there also a chess club or team? No, I'm afraid not. It may be best for you to put a notice on our notice board to find other players. Will that cost me anything? No, it's a free service available to all students. But you have to give your notice to a union officer first, so that it's fair for everyone who wants to use the notice board. I only have a room for one month at the moment. I need to find a house or a flat to live in near the college. Are you able to help me with any accommodation problems? There are always rooms available in shared flats or houses on our notice board. The college has some of its own accommodation, and you can also apply for these. If you have any problems at all, you should talk to one of the student union's welfare officers, who can give specialist advice on accommodation. Thank you for your help. You're welcome. Now would you mind helping us? We're conducting a survey to learn more about the students who visit our union office, so that we can improve our services. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? Not at all. Now look at questions 5 to 10. As you listen to the student's conversation with the union officer, fill in the spaces 5 to 10 on the form. First, you have some time to look at the form. Now listen carefully and fill in gaps 5 to 10. Now would you mind helping us? We're conducting a survey to learn more about the students who visit our union office so that we can improve our services. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? Not at all. First of all, what is your name? 
My name is Cesar Bautisto. How do you spell your last name? B A U T I S T O. Thank you. And what are you studying? Development economics. I see. And how long is the course for? One year. It's a postgraduate diploma. What would you like to do at the end of it? Have you made your mind up yet? Yes, I'd like to be a United Nations project advisor. Oh, would you? That sounds interesting. Tell me, though, why have you chosen this university? It's got a good reputation in the field of economics. And you say you come from the Philippines? Yes, that's right. And which city do you come from? Manila. Oh, that's the city I've always wanted to go to. What do you do in your spare time? I go to play games. I love sports. Ah, yes, you mentioned that. Basketball, badminton, and wrestling, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Okay, that's it. I'll add your name to our mailing list. We appreciate your help with this survey. If you have any suggestions, be sure to give us a call or drop by at any time. All right, I will. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions eleven to fifteen. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time, and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan, what was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback. And lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday, so I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over forty thousand years, and of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park, the remarkable Walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin, so we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Buranga, but the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain. So we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions sixteen to twenty. As the talk continues, answer questions sixteen to twenty. So the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient Aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. 
When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help, and as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk by a wildlife specialist on a type of bird called a kiwi. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the Kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as Kiwis. Now, while Kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the Kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on our stamps and coins. The Kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps and feed on insects, worms, snails and berries. It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose, because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, kiwi numbers have dropped from 12 million to less than 70,000 and our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat kiwi eggs and their chicks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Program in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this program. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we are hoping to educate people about the plight of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, we go out to the kiwi's natural habitat and we collect kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part, because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year, and their chances of survival have increased from 5 to 85%. However, it's not time to celebrate Kiwi survival just yet. About 95% of Kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection. Which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a man giving a lecture on nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. I'd like to start by thanking so many of you for attending this, my first public lecture at this magnificent university. I'm going to be talking to you today about nuclear fusion. Before I proceed further, I would like to apologize on behalf of some of our newspapers for the sensationalist and hopelessly inaccurate articles that have been published on the subject over the years. I must confess that my own interest in the subject was actually stimulated by an article published more than 50 years ago in a popular Sunday tabloid with the impressive title Power from the Sea. Today, most people would probably interpret such a title as an introduction to a discussion on the latest developments in renewable energy sources, such as wave technology or generating electricity from tidal flows. But back then, little, if any, progress had been made in these fields since the invention of the water wheel. As I recall, following coverage of the opening of the world's first commercial nuclear power station more than 50 years ago now at calder hall in 1956 the article promised that we would have limitless almost free electricity within 10 years it claimed that we could do this using an isotope of water deuterium from the sea 
This would be used in reactors to combine simple molecules of hydrogen to form helium, releasing energy in the process. Of course, this is different from the process of nuclear fission, which today's nuclear reactors use. I wouldn't like to say that the article I read as a boy was totally inaccurate. It's true that the concept of producing energy from nuclear fusion, essentially reproducing the reactions by which our sun and other stars produce energy, depends on fusing atoms of hydrogen, but the time scale suggested was hopelessly wrong. To this day, despite some very embarrassing false claims from scientists who should have known better, we have not been able to produce energy from nuclear fusion in a controllable way. Let me make clear what I mean by this statement, before some journalist in the audience gets hold of the wrong end of the stick. Yes, we have been able to fuse hydrogen atoms to produce helium and a release of energy, but the balance account has always been negative. We've always had to put more energy into the reaction than we've ever succeeded in getting out. We know the theory works, but we still do not know if we can get fusion to work for us and solve the problem of our energy needs. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Here, I will briefly explain these problems before going on to give you a summary of the innovative ways being tested to overcome them. First of all, we have to try to understand the incredible physical conditions that exist inside a natural nuclear fusion reactor, such as the sun. To start with, we have to create temperatures never experienced on our planet. Indeed, if we had experienced the temperatures required, then our planet would never have formed. We have to generate temperatures of at least 100 million degrees Celsius in a carefully controlled environment before we can even hope to produce a fusion reaction. The problems are immense, but it can be done. Many of you will know that you can put your hand into a very hot oven and not get burnt, provided you do not touch any of the surfaces. I won't go into the reasons for this phenomenon here, but we are applying roughly the same principles in designs for fusion reactors. I think I can promise you that the heat will be confined to a very small area. The other major problem we have to find a solution to is pressure. The pressures in a massive body like the sun are vast, and this is what brings the hydrogen atoms into such close proximity to one another that they fuse into helium. We may not have to achieve the same pressures in a fusion reactor, but even so, it is a huge technological problem. What, then, makes me hopeful about the future of energy from nuclear fusion? Perhaps surprisingly, it is developments in laser technology. We can now use lasers to control the nuclear fuel pellets so that they remain suspended inside the reactor without touching the sides. Remember that these pellets are quite small, and because they contain atoms of deuterium and tritium, the two isotopic forms of hydrogen that can be used in these reactions, they are quite light. The lasers will also compress the fuel pellet to raise the pressure to that required to initiate the fusion reaction. Another, far more powerful laser will be used to heat the fuel pellet to the temperature required. This laser, if you like, will act as the trigger to start the reaction. Once started, it is hoped that the reaction will produce enough energy to maintain itself and also that it will produce a surplus in the form of heat that can be used to produce the steam needed to drive turbines in order to generate the electricity the world needs. To give you some idea of how much energy we can produce, 
It has been calculated that just one kilogram of fusion fuel is capable of producing the same amount of energy as 10,000 tons of fossil fuel. I think you would agree that such an objective is worth working towards. I believe, and I am not alone in this, that nuclear fusion could supply the world's energy needs for centuries to come. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.